Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Schenzel. I'm with the Lincoln County Extension um, Office out in Hugo, Colorado. Um, and we're happy, on behalf of my colleagues, we're happy to have everybody on this evening, including our presenters. We're, we're thankful for them to spend some time with us and talk more about the poultry industry um, in general this evening and, and kind of some specific niche things that, that they're each involved in. Um, we think it's kind of, we've got some interesting things going on here in Colorado and then um, outside of Colorado as well with some of our presenters. So um, thank you guys um, for getting on and for, for participating. Um, Rachel Gable uh, with the Fence Post is with us this evening, and she's going to help us uh, kind of moderate the panel a little bit and, and ask some questions. So uh, if you guys are listening, um, we'll talk to each panelist and then we'll have a have a Q&A session as well. So if you have questions, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat and then we'll we'll get those to the panelists here after a bit. Without further ado, um, Rachel's going to get us started here in a little bit, but we're going to start off. Um, Heather Reeder is our, our first panelist. Um, and she's with the CSU Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And we're going to have her um, start uh, to kind of introduce what she does with poultry in Colorado. Heather? Yeah, great. Hi, everybody. Um, glad to be here tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Heather Ryder. I'm with uh, Colorado State University. Um, and my role kind of within the poultry industry, if you will, is I... Um, I'm one of the coordinators for the Colorado Avian Health Program. And for those of you who don't, don't know kind of what that means, it means that we're kind of an interesting program. We get cooperative agreement funding dollars to run the avian influenza surveillance throughout the state. And I'm sure a lot of you um, are probably very aware of what's happening with avian influenza right now. And if not, hopefully we'll get a chance to probably touch on that a little bit at some point. Um, but so that's part of my position is... Um, we, we run the National Poultry Improvement Plan here through Colorado. Um, and so a lot of the producers, whether that's commercial, backyard flocks, um, are part of our NPIP program here in Colorado. So that's one kind of area that we specialize in. The other area we specialize in is diagnostics. So we are the vet diagnostic lab at CSU. So we're a really interesting integrated program because of that. Um, so sometimes I'm actually the one setting the test for the even influenza. So I get to play a, a dual role in that. Um, and then kind of the other role we play is a lot of this kind of outreach community engagement. And so um, if you guys uh, are fair goers or you've been to the state fair or any of your county fairs, especially if you're on the front range, I would sadly sad to say that if you're somewhere else within the state of Colorado, sometimes during fair season, it's very difficult for us to get out there, but we really try to reach out to our 4-H groups and our kids and um, we're out there at the fair doing all the testing um, for avian influenza and the general health. So we, we, we're, we're out there in the community quite a bit. We're a small program. We're not very big, but we rely on our veterinary students because we are part of the vet teaching hospital diagnostics at CSU. And as many of you probably know, um, trying to find a poultry vet in the world, there's just not a ton. And so anytime we can engage our upcoming veterinarians in kind of poultry health medicine, um, there are a lot of times we'll we hire several Throughout our year, uh, every year we hire four to five of them to come out and kind of learn about poultry medicine and to kind of engage with the community and just kind of gain some extra specialty in that area. Um, so I think I was going to kind of talk just real briefly on those. I won't go into any great details. I know there's a lot of panelists, um, but I was just going to give a quick overview of our Colorado industry, um, just kind of in from a big picture kind of um view, if you're looking kind of what Colorado industry is, um, we are uh, an egg layer um, state. We don't have many meat birds because of the altitude. They don't do well here. We do have um, a facility here, but it's they're raising the grandparent stocks for the, the meat facilities. Um, we do uh, 5 point, or 5.12 million, sorry, we have 5.12 million layers in Colorado, like at a commercial production level. That's about 1.5 billion eggs a year. Um, you know, so an average bird, I think, is around you know three to five, or was it three to five hundred eggs a year? Someone can correct me on that if I'm a little wrong on my stats. It might be a little rusty in that area. Um, but so that's a 21 um, million dollar industry here in Colorado. So it's, it's sizable. Um, the the data that I have though is just it, it hasn't been the new stuff hasn't come out. Um, the last, well, I guess it did come out in 2022. So we are number 15 in egg production through the United States. So not, you know, not, not small. Um, we have a lot of 
niche markets, if you will. We have a lot of uh, backyard poultry um, exhibition, you know, um, people that are going to those fairs and shows. We have a lot of kind of smaller range, maybe um, 3,000 or less, maybe, and that's kind of our organic, maybe meat bird market. We have some in that area, um, especially birds and other game bird, game bird and waterfowl um, enthusiasts in Colorado. Um, through the NPIP program, most commercial entities are a part of that, and a lot of backyard flocks are part of that. So for those of you who are less familiar with the National Poultry Improvement Plan, it is um, a voluntary program that kind of started back in uh, 1935 when chlorum uh, typhoid uh, it's a, it's a disease that really impacts poultry and it basically kind of decimated our entire U.S. industry, it kind of brought it to its knees. And so uh, the stakeholders, meaning like industry, the government, and kind of other entities got together and formed this like, diag or this, it was based around diagnostic testing around chlorum in that time. And how do we not keep setting this disease through the hatcheries out into, um, into the, the United States? So it's been very successful. Um, so chlorum being the foundational disease that we test for, and we still do that to this day. If you're an NPIP participant, whether you're a backyard flock or commercial flock, you're either part of that chlorum, um, you know, making sure that the birds you buy are chlorum free, or we're out there actually testing your birds for chlorum. Depends on what subpart you're in. Um, and we do a lot of avian influenza surveillance because there's a lot of funding for avian influenza because that is kind of the really um, disease of concern. In 2015, there was a big outbreak. Again, it hurts the industry quite a bit. And this year, <laughs> we are on that kind of, we don't know where we are, but so far we've had a lot of outbreaks. Um, small outbreaks. Luckily, we've been able to kind of get them under control, but throughout the eastern part of the United States. Um, so just our commercial egg layer industry, we have about um, five um, large layers that are about 500 to a million birds or larger. Um, the rest of those kind of are, are, we have about 21 flocks that are anywhere from 10,000 bird barns to 25,000 bird barns. And I think we have one that that's 50,000 bird barns. So individually, they're actually kind of considered small. But collectively, they're very large. A lot of those are on the Western Slope and down the Alamosa area. Um, we do have a multiplier meat type chicken uh, breeding flock. Uh, and also, um, and then we have, uh, like I said, 50 backyard flocks that participate in the NPIP. And those are unique flocks that are either going to exhibition, so they need the testing to move over state lines or to go to exhibition, or they're actually as a small business trying to sell hatching eggs or eggs um, through the United States. And so that helps them achieve some of the testing, not all the requirements they need, but it helps them achieve most of that. Uh, we have some game bird facilities and then uh, Tom can tell you about his facility later. Um, so yeah, and then just so you know, we are the diagnostic lab at CSU. So if you guys have sick birds or you've got something going on your flock or even it doesn't have to be high path, but obviously if it is high path, you should call us. But you know, it can be any kind of thing. We are a full service diagnostic lab. A necropsy is the best um, kind of way we can look at what's going on with your flock. We offer necropsy services. We offer a lot of other diagnostic services for a lot of the respiratory diseases. And if we don't offer it in our lab, we can often coordinate with other labs to make sure you get the testing you need. And we're right here in Colorado. So um, right now, though, because of the influenza A um, virus, we do a lot of testing around that, especially with the NPIP program. Um, and so right now, this past year, we have actually tested over 8,000 birds throughout the state. So now the way in, even influenza, and maybe that sounds actually kind of low for thinking how much poultry we have in the United States, but when you think about avian influenza, it's not really an individual bird disease, it's a flock-based disease. So that's really more like 8,000 premises or 8,000 flocks that have been tested for avian influenza. And those flock sizes can be quite large. So because it is a disease that runs through flocks. So we actually do have quite a bit of reach. And like I said, we're at swap shows, um, you know, different poultry events. And we're always grabbing that surveillance because with avian influenza, it's always about early detection and kind of controlling it. Um, before it kind of really gets out into the population. Because once it gets out there, it's pretty significant. So yes, um, I don't know if we're gonna provide numbers <laughs> at the end or maybe I'll throw it up in chat. But if you guys ever have avian, we do have a hotline at CSU for the avian health program. And when I say hotline, maybe it's more of a poultry like kind of question diagnostic line because we don't we don't respond 24 hours a day. We kind of respond within 72 hours of getting the call. 
And, but we get all sorts of questions, everything from, you know, it could be marriage disease or just an illness, um, something husbandry related going on in your flock. And it can be as, or veterinary um, vets will call us with questions about what kind of diagnostic testing we offer. Um, and so we are kind of a full service. And if we can't answer it, we are connected to the resources that can. So that's another reason to call us because we can connect you guys to the resources you need. And maybe that's even a local vet in your area. So um, anyways, um, I guess I'll stop there. Um, and then if you guys have questions later on, just ask. Perfect, thank you, Heather. Um, Brandon, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, my name is Brandon Leg. I'm with Legs Peafowl Farm and Legs Landing, uh, based out of Kansas City, Missouri. We specialize in raising peafowl, um, making new colors, having genetics, things like that is our niche market that we do. Um, Back in 1980, there was five different colors of peafowl. Now there is, in this, in 2020, there was 20 plus different colors and over 200 different varieties. Um, big portion has been created here on our farm. We work heavily, we work very closely with Missouri um, MPIP program, avian influenza free. Um, and we've, that's basically what we, specialize in. Um, we raise a lot of birds each year and just try to, they're raised and sold mainly to be looked at just for their beauty. So. Perfect, thank you, Brandon. Um, Kristen, if you'd like to, to go next. Sure, I'm Kristen Ramey uh, and I own Long Shadow Farm in Bertha, Colorado. Um, we raise a lot of different uh, animals on our farm for meat, but we also raise poultry, um, chickens, turkeys, ducks, and quails um, for eggs and meat for both of them. Um, my daughter is 12, she's also a 4-H member and she shows all of those poultry at fair as well. So we have a mix of production and show birds on our farm. Um, and all of the meat birds that we raise on our farm, ducks, turkeys, and chickens, and even the quail, um, we process them on our farm ourselves. Thank you. Amelia? Hi, uh, my name is Amelia Macy, and um, I'm a 4-H member in Lamar County, Colorado. Um, I've been raising birds for uh, 12 years now. And I've shown birds for nine. And so um, that's my, uh, my areas. What I love to do is show and exhibit my birds. Um, I spe specialize in uh, white Plymouth rock bantams and black rose cone bantams. Um, and all this experience in raising and showing these birds has actually allowed me to write a new uh, Colorado poultry handbook for 4-H members. So um, that's what I've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, Andrea has been really helpful with that but it's basically a book that 4-H um, members can use who are just getting started in the poultry project. And it covers the basics for raising and showing all species of poultry that you can show in 4-H. Um, it's peer reviewed um, in affiliation with Colorado State University and um, full color, full bleed print. It's available on Amazon now. So that's super exciting. So 4-H uh, poultry members now have that resource. And, uh, and if you're interested, um, I can send that Amazon link out. But um, now it's uh, like I said, it's the official card of 4-H Poultry Handbook, and I'm, uh, we're working right now on getting it available as a national 4-H resource for poultry members, too. So that's really fun. Uh, I also own a small dove release business called Angel Releases, and so I cover um, Fort Collins, Timnath, Windsor, a um, couple cities in the Front Range, and um, I release, I don't actually do doves, I do white homing pigeons, and so I also um, breed and show and train these white homing pigeons for these releases as well. So I have um, not only some exhibition experience and just backyard poultry raising experience, but I also have experience in uh, with poultry as a small business owner. So yeah, it's a little bit about me. Thanks, Amelia. Uh, Tom, if you'd like to go ahead. Be happy to. My name is Tom Whiting. I'm out on the western side of the state in near a city called Delta or a little town 
I have a company unimaginatively called Whiting Farms, which I started back in 1989. Uh, we do something that's very unusual. It's truly a niche, niche business. Uh, we breed rooster lines. their feathers, which are used to tie fishing flies. Uh, only a few people in the world do it, but for over 30 years now. And we raise the birds. They have very long, flowing feathers. They're all kinds of colors. Uh, there's a large genetic program involved with it. We sell most of our product outside the United States. States is our single largest birds we sell outside. So very much a discretionary type of product we sell, these feathers and packages. We sell in specialty fly fishing shops and big box distributors and distribution and these, but we also supply fly tying factories that use the flies in mass. Anyway, it's it's a lot of fun. It's rather difficult. I have about 25 full-time employees. We have uh, two ranches and about 27 sheds plus a, 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 a hatchery. Also, on top of this, I've been doing commercial poultry for a number of years since the late 90s and flies in high production blue and green egg layers and those stocks. I sell breeders of these to mail order hatcheries around the country as well. And it's uh, another little avenue of fighting. We, just, we don't ship in the mail, we always buy the local market, but people have come from as far away as San Diego to pick up chicks. Anyway, that's something that's small compared to the feather operation, but it's growing. There's a lot of interest in birds, flies, and anyway, uh, that's my story. I was born in Colorado, but I went to school at CSU for undergraduate, University of Georgia for my master's. That was at the University of Arkansas. My story. Thank you, Tom. We appreciate that. Now we'll let uh, Rachel is our last panelist for the evening, and and then we'll let her introduce herself, and then she's going to help to to moderate questions for us. So if you guys um, have questions, please type them in the chat, and if if not, we'll we'll let Rachel get started. Sure, I'm Rachel Gable, and I am certainly the least qualified panelist by a mile. Um, I'm the assistant editor of the Fence Post magazine. I write exclusively about agriculture, primarily about the protein industries, and I write quite a bit about legislation, and that is really my familiarity um, outside of just having some chickens here at, the, at our ranch, but um, that's primarily my affiliation, my familiarity with the industry. Uh, there was a cage-free requirement uh, bill that was passed several years ago that will require all of the eggs sold in the state to come from a cage-free environment. And I followed that quite a bit. And uh, so that I think that communicating those legislative changes and also communicating as far as disease outbreaks and information from extension, um, those are probably the roles that I am most involved with within that industry though I'm really excited to learn about the other panels because uh, you guys are doing such interesting and really important and valuable work. And I'm so, so proud to be part of this. So we have kind of a slate of questions and I don't know that we need um, everyone to answer each one, but I'll give them out. And if our panelists have one that uh, really grabs them, then, uh, then we'll, we'll do that. I think the, the first one we, we touched on a little bit was um, how each of the panelists got involved in the poultry industry. And, in, and I think part of that question could also be, what are those resources that you found that were helpful as you were getting started? Is there a, a, a panelist that would like to touch on that? Sorry, I'm scrolling. I can't see all of you all at once. You're all good. I can talk a bit on that. Um, 
Yeah. So um, 4-H was the really big thing that got me into the poultry industry or um, at least the parts that I'm involved in. So that's been really cool. Um, My family got a backyard flock when I was six. And so I've just been around birds for most of my life. Um, But the resources that I have found really, really helpful um, has especially been the American Poultry Association Standard of Perfection for those of you out there who are interested in exhibiting birds. Um, that's kind of invaluable. I also uh, really like Gail Damro's uh, chicken encyclopedia. That was helpful to me as a young 4-H member getting started. Um, let's see what else. And then also just contacting local veterinarians at CSU and um, local poultry experts like who are involved in 4-H. I found that also to be super helpful. So uh, just finding those people local to you. Um, another way I was able to get involved was to just go to some local poultry shows to connect with breeders, connect with judges. Um, so that's especially for exhibition. And I found that to be invaluable as I figured out what on earth I was doing with all of this. Well, very good. Tom or Brandon, could one of you guys touch on some of the resources that you had at your fingertips as far as genetics and how you, you learned uh, moving through that experience? Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, we took in, um, we've been raising, or my dad kind of started it 50 years ago, been raising peafowl ever since then. And so we just started with genetics, started playing around. We used a lot of vets, talking to um, different college classes on genetics. And over the last 20 years is when we've really got involved in creating new colors and making new colors succeed um and even patterns things like that i kind of started in 93 when we ran across a new pattern um and ever since then we've just kind of got hooked and just kept rolling with it um and we every year we're trying to make something new make something more beautiful to look at and, and that's that's all of our main things that we're moving for with the resources is just mainly reaching out to other people that we've met with birds over the years um and just trial and error so basically everything that we're doing anybody else can do and we help everybody that contacts us and tries to push them in the right direction and that's kind of what we do the resources on pfal themselves there's not a lot out there we have a website we've got genetics on it but other than that there's not a lot of you know a lot of interest or a lot of pushing to create new resources so it's mainly just calling people and talking to them and trial and error is how we did all of our genetics. Sure. Brandon, is there a particular pattern or a particular color that people really associate you, your farm with that you're really known for? Um, back in 1998, we kind of found a new color mutant bird called Midnight. That's kind of what started us off. Um, we had some other patterns that we found in 1993. And ever since then, just anything new that somebody's looking for, they reach out to us. Um, there's not really a set color, a set pattern. It's all based on per- personal preference on what you want to look at. Some people want to look at a solid bird. Some people want to look at a spotted bird, which is called the pies. Or some people that want to look at a bird with the majority of the white and a little bit of color. So basically anything that anybody wants or is looking for they reach out to us and for the most part we can we have every variety there is possible at this current point is there new colors being there's new colors out there in america today we just have to find them there's new patterns that's being created and it's just one of those that it's never ending so that's kind of what we push to keep finding and enjoying so it's a family the family run business and we're all involved with it and so that's kind of what we we're just keep going towards tom do you want to touch on that as well well i'd say i was a beneficiary of the land grant university systems that i went to but i also did summer inter- internships with primary breeders or poultry genetic companies and still network with uh as it's specialty is poultry genetics and we've done a lot of things on our own because there's n- not much written about plumage genetics and we've had to figure it out on our own and try to figure out new lines uh, customers tell us what they want and i try to figure out how to do it on their chicken that's been long-term incremental somewhat difficult 
business, but it's quite rewarding to have done it. From a from a business management standpoint and from an equipment standpoint, was there what is the kind of standard that you that you found that you depend upon um, as far as um, software or equipment? So equipment, I started off with uh, buying up a number of out of business mink ranches and putting the the birds, the roosters, in individual cages like mink were contained. Because the roosters will be roosters and will want to fart, uh, fight and uh, destroy the very reason you're trying to raise them. So I ended up buying a bunch of mink ranches as the fur industry in the in Colorado was going down. And I even hired a few mink raisers, and they had some interesting ideas. We build most of our own cages and facilities now. They're all environmentally controlled. They're, each cage has got its own feeder and nipple drinker. And they're all environmentally controlled and light and ventilation. So it's pretty high tech now, but it started off rather simple. Uh, but we've just had to kind of figure it out on our own because what we do is not what practically anyone else does in the poultry industry. Very, very different and for the fun. That is interesting. Kristen, I know you mentioned that you do your own processing there on the farm. What uh, what did you learn about equipment as your operation grew? Oh boy! Well, I do want to <laughs> a loaded that. question. Yeah, we've been running our farm since uh, 2007, and back then YouTube wasn't such a big thing. Um, we got inspired by several of Joel Salatin's books, including "You Can Farm" and "Pastured Poultry Profits." So we started our meat bird operation following Joel Salatin's model. We learned how to butcher chickens by following the instructions in his book, which were accompanied by a handful of black and white photos. Um, that was quite a challenge. Uh, and we quickly realized that everything we were trying to do by hand um, would be better suited uh, to using equipment. So in 2008, we purchased the Featherman um, Scalder and Plucker system that we still use today. Uh, the original equipment we bought, I, I think I owned it for 12 years before I had to replace the rubber fingers on the plucker. Um, and it's not much different in price now as it was 15 years ago. Um, it, it's, you know, three grand plus or minus a little bit if you want some of the extra bells and whistles to get started um, managing a, a poultry processing operation. Of course, there's equipment that gets bigger and more mechanized. Um, but as a small uh, as a small producer, that equipment has served us well. Are you? Do you have to be USDA inspected there at your facility, Kristen? No, in the state of Colorado and in probably several other states, the USDA has what they call a small farm exemption. Um, poultry producers who um, process less than a thousand birds a year um, do not need to be USDA inspected, um, but they have restrictions. And in Colorado, some of those um, restrictions include, I have to raise the birds on my property and I have to butcher them. I can't butcher anybody else's birds. Um, I have to sell those birds direct to consumer. I can't, I can't go through grocery stores or other retail outlets. And I have to sell them whole. I can't part them into breasts, wings, and thighs. I have to sell the birds whole. Um, there's labeling requirements and there's a lot more to it. But the USDA has had, um, they have three layers of inspection um, and the, the small farm exemption is the one that, that works for us. The next size up is 20,000 birds or less um, is considered custom exempt. Um, so it's not full USDA inspected. Uh, once you get above 20,000 birds, then you need to be a USDA inspector facility, which means there's a USDA inspector on site the whole time you're butchering. Um, both of those would also require you working with the Department of Ag in the state, um, as well as your local building uh, code type people, because now you have to have a facility. When you're doing the thousand birds or less, you can do it um, under a tent in your yard. You don't need to be inside of a building to do it. Interesting. Amelia, could you talk from an exhibition standpoint about the equipment that was really the game changer for you as you were coming through your 4-H showing career? Um, yeah, so there's a couple things. I think uh, one of the bigger ones was actually um, having different stages of 
um, housing for birds. So building those extra coops so you can keep your young birds separated from your old birds and uh, different areas for if you buy your chicks at different times, you hatch at different times, uh, you have multiple places you can keep your young birds to keep your hens separate, keep your cocks separate. Um, so I found that really helpful. But another big thing that I was able to do in the past couple of years was actually invest in a heated barn, uh, which was really, really helpful in keeping birds combs from freezing over. And uh, it was able, like, I was able to keep my roosters looking good for longer because usually in Colorado, especially here, you can get frostbite on your combs really easily. And so I think that just having really good coops, I think is, was big, especially for me. Um, I guess equipment wise, I think that would be the big thing. Right. Do you think it's fair to say that for 4-H kids, if they're listening and they're thinking about getting into that, the old um, you know, clean pen, clean water, clean feed is a, a good jumping off place. Yeah, I'd say that's a good place to start for sure. Just making sure you have all those basics. Um, if you do have birds with big combs, I recommend keeping a heat lamp in your, in your coop to just, you know, make sure that you're keeping your birds warm and um, making sure that it's not drafty in your coop. That's a big way that birds get frostbite. And so, yeah, I think that those are easy ways to keep your birds looking good for fair and through the winter. Yep. Well, very good. Well, we talked a little bit. We'll just hang with you, Amelia, for just a second. We talked about how uh, our, our next question on here is about how younger kids, younger people can get involved in, in the industry. And we know that you came through the 4-H program and that you're really kind of finding your niche with uh, the writing, which of course I think is great. Are there... Um, are there, have you heard much about uh, internships or anything like that? I know that Tom mentioned that a little bit. Is that something that you've looked into or that you've participated with? Um, well, so specifically with poultry, um, no. I have been able to do a lot of higher level volunteer positions. Um, I've been able to serve as a junior superintendent in the poultry project in Lambert County 4-H for, for the past four years. So I suppose in a sense, that's kind of like an internship. You get to really understand how um, all the, the 4-H program works, but um, I ha um, am not actually pursuing ag as a, for higher education, I'm, I'm going into writing, I think, but, um, but yeah, it's actually this experience that I've been able to do has been able to open up a couple other opportunities. Um, I'm hoping to get a job in, um, I'm working on getting a job in editing right now. So, um, so that's been pretty cool. But no poultry specific internships have come my way. Uh, Brandon and Tom, you guys both spoke about um, having some mentors with genetics. Is that, is that mentorship? Is that a good way for younger producers to get involved? Go ahead, Brandon. I'd say that's a very good way for younger people to get involved. Um, and a lot of people, they will buy eggs or they'll buy young chicks, day old chicks, because that's when the stuff's the cheaper ones and more economical for kids starting out and just start raising them. Um, and that way they learn the do's and the don'ts and keeping them clean and keeping the space and all that. And so, you know, finding somebody that you can talk to or you can call or you can message about any questions on what's going on. What, you know, why does my bird not look right or what can I do to make it better? So having that, you know, mentor is very crucial for young children. Tom, in, with regards to um, learning the business from the ground up and um, going through that mentorship and, of course, coming through a land-grant university program, what, um, what is the, the one thing that you look back at and think, boy, if I had known that, things would have been easier? Well, from running a business, I probably would have been better off getting an MBA than a PhD, I'll tell you that, because on a day-in, day-out basis, there was a lot more dollar decisions than there are genetic decisions. But I actually did have a fair amount of industrial experience. I rose up in one of the Colorado commercial egg complexes to production manager, and had I not done that, you know, because we were producing three million eggs a week and a million pounds of feed used, all the building that I did there, that was probably the most valuable thing I could have done. It really set me off looking 
he realized I wanted to have my own company. I'm still good friends with the owners of that company. They were, they were mentors to me. But I've had a number of interns come to Whiting Farms, my company, over the years. I've got one here right as, as we speak. He's coming up from Texas A&M, working on his PhD in poultry genetics, which is going to work into my program. But I've had a number of other ones from different universities around the country, mostly Georgia and Arkansas, where they have larger poultry science departments. And I did have one a couple of years ago. It was a young fella from Georgia, and he was very cocky and very wanted to come up and do it and everything, but he hadn't gotten an education, a proper, a formal education. And we, and he spent about three months here, I think it was. But because he hadn't had that foundation of information that an undergraduate degree in poultry science maybe it provides, he kind of didn't know the even questions to ask. And uh, so it was obvious to us that if somebody's going to really want to make a career in the poultry industry, they could do it other ways, but it's really good to get an undergraduate degree in poultry science, just so you know the basics. And a master's degree comes after that pretty easily. But if you're going to do something pretty high level technically or specialty, you know, you might even have to get a PhD. But I never did the 4-H or the FFA. I just had chickens and game bird when I was a kid and worked on farms and found out you could get a degree in it. That's what I did. Well, very good. Uh, we certainly are all aware of the rising input costs. I know we've been burning lots of $5 diesel and feeding lots of $7 corn to $1.30 cattle. And so we're quite aware of that and everybody is. Um, how is that impacting your business moving forward. Let's start with Brandon on that. Uh, it's impacting everything. You know, a lot of it is just being more conscientious on what you do, watching your waste, things like that. You know, um, we do free feed on our birds, so they always have food to eat, but keeping out the nuisance animals, make sure you don't have anything. The other thing is, is unfortunately the, the cost of the animals does go up. And so, even over the last several years and with COVID and all that, the price of animals has gone up. Um, and a lot of people, you know, if they want to look at something and now they're home more. So they're, you know, we haven't had a lot of pushback on the rising cost on our end. So we just kind of keep on, we pass it right on down uh, to the customers. So it's unfortunate, but it's how business is today. Sure. Kristen, how do how did uh, how are the rising costs impacting you? And and maybe talk a little bit about how uh, COVID impacted you with uh, processing gluts and um, supply chain issues. Well, one of the one of the benefits of um, processing becoming a real problem in COVID is that I process my own poultry, so um, I didn't I wasn't dependent on finding a spot in the processor where the lambs and cows we raise on our farm, that, that became a huge problem. So being a little independent in that regard really helped out. Um, people were looking for meat to buy uh, and I had it. So that was super beneficial as well um, to kind of be there in that market space when people were looking for a product. And it allowed folks to step outside their comfort zone. Um, somebody that might not otherwise have been pushed to look for chicken from a local farm when they went to their local grocery store and they didn't have chicken on the, on the shelf, then they did start looking. So we were able to find some new customers. However, um, whether it's eggs or meat production, um, one of the biggest inputs into a chicken is feed. And so when those feed costs change, so does your uh, pricing model it has to change so that you can continue to be profitable. Um, and, and when people are really price sensitive, like they are right now about the food they're buying to feed their family, um, when we make a minute change in our pricing structure because our input costs have changed dramatically, uh, it can have an impact. So you've got to understand your customer base and uh, what they can handle. You've also got to be able to manage, um, you know, can you do better on the pricing without, without detriment to the animal itself, right? You don't, you don't buy food that they aren't supposed to eat because it's cheaper, you need to feed your birds appropriate food um, for the life stage that they're in. 
but the same token, what can you do to make that as economical for you as possible so that you can keep that profit margin that keeps you in business? Um, selling product at you know less than the cost you're putting into it to make it isn't going to keep you in business for very long. Uh, so you've got to have a very good understanding of how um, the price of your supplies and your feed going into your product is going to have an impact. I think all the other producers on the call today are very much uh, niche markets and um, less food. So I, I do want to come back to you again, Kristen, and talk about how you communicate to those folks who have strong opinions about food choices and whether it be organic or free range or brown eggs, green eggs, you know, whatever those choices might be, how do you communicate that and market yourself to your consumers? So for me, I'd have to say that we are a relatively small operation. I'm not trying to be the every woman for, for every grocery store shopper out there. Um, you know, we built our farm on folks who are interested in how their animals were raised. Those were some of our initial customers were people that cared about um, not just how, but they wanted to see. And so we welcome folks onto our farm uh, to come see how we raise our, our poultry and our lamb and everything, um, as well as folks that want to be a part of the process. So we do um, allow folks, uh, they all have to sign liability waivers, but we do allow folks to come onto the farm and watch us process poultry. Uh, we teach people how to process poultry. We've never had aspirations to become the size of a Purdue um, or anything like that. We just wanna serve our small community, but we know we're a higher price point uh, than some places and we're not gonna pick up everybody. Uh, I have an adage that I don't, not everybody has to be my customer. Um, and I'm okay with walking away from a customer where my product doesn't fit their needs. And I'm okay with that. I don't have to win everybody over. Uh, I have found the clientele that enjoy my products. Um, they know how hard we work and they're willing to pay a little extra for it compared to what they might see when they price shop at a grocery store. So you've got to know what your product is um, and what your price points are. Um, and we don't waver on our price um, just because somebody says you're too expensive. Right. Um, Heather, Heather, could you visit with us a little bit about uh, the impacts the avian influenza might have as we move forward into 2022 overall for the entire industry? Yeah, definitely. Um, Everyone's really nervous right now because it has the, from a global standpoint, it really has the um, potential to impact trade, right? And so from a large picture scale, that's very nervous, um, makes a lot of states very nervous um, because trade is one of our biggest kind of, um, for exports and imports are some of our biggest, um, how we make a lot of that money in poultry. So it, and in what happens for an individual business, so on a more micro, smaller scale, is um, if high path is in, maybe it's not at your farm, but it's in your area, and maybe it's with the, with the if you are a farm, or in, that, in a lot of these actually outbreaks here um, this year, are actually in backyard blocks. So is if there's an outbreak um, in your area, basically what the, they'll do is they kind of put a pinpoint on that and they put a radius around that and say that this is the impacted area. So anybody that's in that quarantine zone can actually move birds. <clears throat> now, there are some avenues for commercial producers to get part of the Colorado egg, or not, sorry, it's, uh, well, it's for egg trade for large scale producers. So if they meet certain biosecurity, then it's faster for them to issue permits so they can continue to move product and they don't get backed up in their product and have financial. But for a smaller scale producer, that probably doesn't exist. And so trying to move birds out of your quarantine area, especially if your business is selling hatching eggs or, you know, chicks, um, you wouldn't be able to do, wouldn't be able to move anything until they deem that area clear. Um, so like if you're trying to import, say right now, I was just talking with the state of California today, um, and so California has issued a quarantine order. So you cannot ship any birds into California if you're part of a quarantine. So that's not impacting Colorado because right now we don't have any high path in Colorado. 
But if you were on the eastern, you know, east coast and say you're one of those communities that's impacted by high path, you may not be able, and maybe you have a huge market in California, you may, you may, but you're impacted, you may not be able to move your product to California. So that could have a lot of micro business impact with high path AI. Um, the thing that they're not sure of is because right now this is coming over on the wild bird market migration, waterfowl or natural reservoirs for even influenza, but they're not they don't necessarily always get sick from it. Now, sometimes they can have mild symptoms, but one like dime size um, fecal like material um, can, you know, is enough to affect millions of birds. So um, it's a highly contagious disease and any bird that gets high path, especially high path avian influenza, most birds are not, they're not gonna survive it. Like it, it's, it's, it's kind of a death sentence for birds. So that's why states react so quickly and so fast to contain it, because if it does get out there and it gets into all these blocks, it has huge impacts, both on trade and that's interstate trade and, and so like local levels and then also kind of United States and then global levels. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you. Tom, you mentioned that you sell quite a few of your genetics outside of the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about how the regulations affect your operation? Um, we export a lot of the final product, so we're not exporting the genetics. Well, they're in there, but they can't right. use them. Uh, we have seen in the past when there's been other breaks of avian influenza, some foreign countries will put a blockade on American poultry products in general. And we do get export certificates in order to go overseas. To, to some countries require it, not all. And that has been some hurdles and blockages or delays shipments and whatnot. So that's a pretty large concern because we're two thirds export. Uh, I think the world is becoming more knowledgeable about it. So they're not quite so knee jerk, just prohibit all poultry products from the United States. Uh, I do anticipate some problems though this year with uh, the way the avian influenza is spreading and it's now been in Missouri and uh, Iowa right now. So it's making its way from the east, eastern seaboard where it really got started. And it's now m here in the mid part of the country. I do sell breeding stock to mail order hatcheries. And I wonder if that's, I just, I don't know yet, but that might be impacted by interstate traffic of that. Um, one comment I'd make on COVID and that some of the other people were talking about, when this all came around, people became more concerned with where their food was coming from. And there's been a definite uh, increase in people's interest in producing their own birds, both for their eggs, meat, and maybe having poultry around as well. So I've seen a rather large increase in interest in people inquiring about that kind of thing. Even the fly tying feathers, because people were stuck at home, they were stuck at home tying flies. So we saw quite a boost in demand for our products worldwide. It's sort of ironic, and I feel a little sheepish admitting it, but it's our benefit. Sure. Brandon, uh, what are some of the regulations that, that really affect your business? Do we lose him? Oh, oh, other regulations is the MPIP program and the avian influenza. Um, we go to different, we sell birds, whether it's over the internet or at auctions, things like that. And having, uh, depending on the state that we travel to, depends on their regulations. Um, we try to, we keep everything as healthy as possible and go through all of our, like our AI testing we do twice a year on the farm for um, avian influenza free flocks. We don't raise any waterfowl or anything like that. So we're not, I won't say we're as much at risk. Yes, we're at risk from migratory birds, but we don't have, you know, waterfowl there at the farm to attract the migratory birds necessarily. So, you know, we limit um, people coming in and just limit the birds coming in so we don't bring in something. So, but the regular... The regulatory is just following the states that we travel to and transport the animals to. Amelia, it's, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Rachel. I have a really quick question um, because Brandon had mentioned migratory birds um, as being a potential um, carrier of 
um, avian influenza. Uh, so I have a question for Heather really quick. Um, is that, does that affect all species of birds or just certain types? <laughs> Sorry, as an extension agent, I should probably know that, but I don't. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. No, it does. It does impact other birds. Um, gallinaceous birds, like especially like game birds, um, uh, poultry, like pheasants, um, peafowl, uh, turkeys, they're susceptible to it. Um, but like waterfowl, like I said, they, they can get the virus, right? But they're able to, it doesn't typically cause the mass mortality that you see in the gallinaceous birds. Um, in saying that, sure, raptors can get it. Songbirds, um, so people, there's a lot of kind of questions around like songbirds and they're not your highest risk. It doesn't mean that there's zero risk with it, um, with, but because it's really kind of the interaction between waterfowl and, because um, they're like the super shedders and when that gets into kind of a poultry farm, that's why we always talk kind of with biosecurity, don't have your waterfowl mixed with your poultry, um, keep those separate. Um, just for those reasons, because of the way those diseases kind of uh, act within those different bird species. Um, what was that? There's something else I was going to say too. Yeah. So even with biosecurity, it's not always just like a waterfowl actually landing like in your property. We're actually the, when they kind of did a lot of work around that 2015 outbreak, humans are actually the biggest spreader of avian influenza. And a lot of that's just with our daily activities. It's this that if people don't have good biosecurity and they don't have, you know, um, and, and it can be even like you're, you're, you, you go to a park and you walk your dog and you're, there's lots of Canada geese out there right now and you're walking around and your shoes and you come back to your farm and you don't change anything and you just kind of come onto your farm, you can bring that disease right in there with you. So it's not actually just having a bird on your premise that causes the disease. It is actually a lot of times too, like with the commercial production at that level, is that they use the same feed truck. So that feed truck will go from site to site to site. But it's just if one of those sites is infected, it can just bring that disease to the other sites. And so that's what they saw with the spread in 2015 was a lot of it was around kind of movement of people and, um, and um, activity. So for backyard flocks, what we're recommending right now Want to have site dedicated shoes and clothing, wash your hands, obviously. Don't visit other people's poultry. Don't let anybody else visit your poultry. Um, if they don't need to be there, don't let them into your flock. Um, you know, limit, you know, this is the time of year when we actually say if you have outdoor birds and you have the ability to keep them inside, I'd keep them inside right now, especially through June. Third, like during the high bird migration, this is our highest risk period. Um, you know, and just it, don't share equipment. And even if that's your car tires and you've gone to a feed store or some other poultry production facility and you're coming back to yours, you want to wash your car and run it through a car wash and disinfect it. So all that stuff can, you know, that's just easy stuff to do. I know sometimes it's a pain in our day-to-day -day life, but, you know, it really, when it comes down to avian influenza and getting it on your flock, it's all around biosecurity. You know, and then just too with feed, make sure you don't have feed spills. Outside, it's attracting wild birds. Um, you know, if you have standing water, obviously try to mitigate against that. You know, you, you have bird houses right now, maybe don't have them out there. Like don't have, don't be feeding wild birds or kind of inviting, you know, any animals. Um, so try to feed your birds inside in their coops um, and don't have that food outside. So kind of all those kind of, because you know, other birds like to land and kind of gather around those feed trays. So anything you guys can do around that is just gonna help protect you even you know, it, and that's kind of in the backyard flock realm. Commercial entities have a lot more biosecurity than that, but those are kind of the basic tenants, you know, and, and those are easy to adopt in the backyard flock. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt the conversation, but I, the songbirds and that kind of songbirds and raptors were kind of like, well, do they carry it too? So anyway. Yeah. yeah any birds can kind of carry it, um, but some are more susceptible. Like especially the gallinaceous birds. Okay. Tom, are there um, particular kind of buzzwords around um, like the food sourcing and labeling that affect what you do? Buzzwords around the, the demand for my product or for how do you mean? Like, are is your demand 
I'm not on the fly tying, not the feather fly tying side of things, but are there um, specific sourcing um, kind of those buzzwords that kind of come and go cyclic in a cyclical way? Are do those are you specialized enough that you're kind of immune to those, or do you see uh, those trends affecting you? Well, I definitely see an increase in trends for alternative poultry. Some people don't really like the modern meat chickens right now because they have some, well, they don't have much taste, some muscle myopathies like woody breast and green muscle disease and spaghetti muscle. You can There's a whole litany of them as they push the meat chickens to grow faster and faster. There's been problems developing with that. Uh, a lot of the people like my birds because they taste better. In fact, they'll often say this is what you know, we have. A, my maiden product is called the Colorado Gold, and it's a ginger feathered uh, meat bird that's medium growth rate, but it's very active, and so it gets out and moves a lot. While the modern broilers don't do that, they just they're marvelous creations of feed efficiency and growth rate. But uh, that motion and moving and growth rate doesn't really translate into particularly good eating in some people's minds. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of interest in that. Uh, and I've got about eight or 10 distinct lines that are specific for taste and type and things like that. And I'm seeing quite a bit of interest in that. Also, I produce some high production blue and green eggs. They're known as the whiting blue and the whiting green. Uh, they're sold pretty uh, Murray Hatchery, that's my biggest customer for breeding stock. So I sell to commercial egg producers now in Colorado who put down flocks of 2,000 of these every couple of months, and they just look better, and they're usually organic or free range. They're always free range. There's a lot of people interested in that. Uh, the press has not been terribly favorable towards cage layers and things like that. So there's a movement towards that. It's still single digit proportions of the market, but it's growing. And I think over time it will continue to grow. I think Colorado would really benefit from having more small USDA poultry processing facilities. If there were available USDA inspected small plants around the state uh, people would be growing a whole lot more meat birds. Christine Have you, I knows. agree with Tom, people don't want to, people want to raise their own meat birds, but they don't want to butcher them. People don't yeah. want to take that step. It's, it's a hard step to take. Um, taking an animal you raised from a baby chick and then taking its life so you can eat it. Um, is a big step for some people And Colorado does not have enough poultry processing facilities at all. As far as I know, there's only, a couple in the state and they're not USDA certified. Right. And that's exactly my point. Plus it's, it's hard work. <laughs> it really hard work. Yeah. And it so is. If, there, <laughs> if there was more processing facilities, there's a real business opportunity. Even people have offered me money to put up a plant, but I've got enough on my plate to, want to do anything more. <laughs> but if they did, there'd be a lot more backyard, locally sourced chicken turkeys and ducks or whatever they want to raise, but that would be a boon to this state and area. Very good. I, I wanted to jump in and, and put a caution out there for anybody interested in starting to um, raise birds um, is to check your, where you live, check your land use code, check your zoning, check your HOA, whatever you might have in front of you to make sure that you can do what you want to do before you get started. It's, this is not the kind of thing where you can ask permission later. You can work to change land use code and you can work to change HOA rules and, and that kind of stuff. But um, it's hard to get started with something and then have a, a phone call from a neighbor, shut it all down. Um, so that's it, just a caution before you get, you know, jumping into wanting to raise a bunch of meat birds or, or have a big breeding operation, make sure that you are allowed to have um, these birds on your property um, and know what your limits may or may not be based on your land use code or covenants or HOA or whatever. That's a good point. That was my, my next question about the importance of being involved in that policy making process. You know, we saw that with 
the the cage free uh, egg bill here that'll have the all of the eggs sold in the state of Colorado will have to come from a cage free environment by 2025, and that includes uh, eggs that are coming in from other states. So, have any of you uh, had some experience being involved in that policy making process, or have a comment about how important that is? Yeah, actually, I, I'm speaking from experience because I misinterpreted the land use code in my county. Um, and most code enforcement folks aren't driving around looking for enforcement things to write, you know, tickets on or fines about. Um, but all it takes is a call from a neighbor. And if you're in violation, then you have to fix that violation. Um, and so I misinterpreted and, and was under the assumption that in Larimer County, they didn't want large commercial poultry facilities like Tyson and Purdue to show up, but I thought that uh, pastured operations were okay, which is what mine is. And it turned out that um, it had slipped under the radar for decades that Larimer County actually didn't allow poultry at all, at all. You couldn't raise poultry, period. And um, I'm not one who caves very easy. And I thought that seemed kind of silly when all our neighboring counties allow poultry to be raised. So I actually spent the last three years working with the county on the agricultural advisory board to help them rewrite the land use code. And it took three years to get chickens um, added back in because the folks that are writing policy don't understand agriculture. That's not their job. Their job is writing policy. And talking with the folks I was working with, they were writing everything from oil and gas regulations to building permit codes. They have to, in a minute, be um, an expert on that thing. And so I had to steal that minute to make sure they were experts on poultry just for enough time that I could get something written into the code uh, that they could then work with as code enforcement officers and, and, and whatever. So they need folks who understand um, you know, how the industry works to help them write that policy because they don't get it. And there are even some, some issues with the way the language was written in the cage-free um, policy that was adopted by Colorado that can cause other issues down the road. So they need people who are really involved um, to be able to help them wordsmith that stuff because it really does matter. And so it is important to get involved um, in policy making to make sure that the voices of agriculture are, are heard um, and are written in so that we can continue to, to you know, pursue our, our dreams of in, in agriculture. Are there any, uh is there any information that I perhaps didn't touch on that any of you would like to, to bring up kind of in closing? Well, we've been having a sidebar conversation in the chat and uh, I get, I teach a lot of backyard chicken classes and, and poultry processing classes. And people always ask me, what's the best this, what's the best that. And, um, what I want to point out, the world of poultry, there are so many breeds of birds out there and they all have their pluses and minuses. And what's right for one operation isn't necessarily right for another. Um, Amelia has specific birds that she likes to breed and my daughter is 12 and she's really trying to convince me to raise silkies and bantams and I don't like them and I don't want them, um, but that's what she finds as great for her. But the breed of, of bird you raise um, and the reason why you're raising it is is going to be specific to you and how you want to run your operation. So there isn't necessarily a best of anything out there. You've got to find what works for you. Amelia, in your book, do you do you touch on what breeds are good fits for different situations? Um, yeah, I actually talk a lot about um, some birds do better in warm climates, some do better in cold, um, some are better layers, some are bigger and better for meat production. Um, I try to touch on a lot of that in my book, just to make sure that everyone is really well educated on what birds they're purchasing. Cause I think that's really important. Um, I know a lot of like, especially small people or like small, um, families who are just getting started in, in raising birds, they'll just go to a feed store and just pick out some random birds or they'll be like, Oh, I've heard that, you know, for example, leghorns are the best layers. They'll do something like that and they'll go buy 10 leghorns and then they'll realize, oh my gosh, I can't handle these birds at all. They're crazy. They're too flighty. I'm eating a lot of eggs, but I can't, I can't do anything with them. And so I think that um, researching the breeds you're going to buy um, and if you're going to try to breed anything, uh, do like talk to breeders, 
talk a, to people who kn know that breed really, really well, because um, little things can, can sneak in that you didn't realize were there. For example, like um, I've been showing rose combs and breeding them now for, I think, five years. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, rose combs, they're amazing. They're beautiful. They're shown at every single poultry show and they always seem to win. And, uh, no one ever told me that rose combs like barely lay any eggs and the eggs that you do get are not often fertile. And so I, in the past five years have hatched four birds total. And so it's, it's bad. And so I would say that if you are ever going to purchase any birds, you have to do your research on them because like you're saying, there is no one fit all poultry breed for any criteria. Brandon, do you have anything to add? Well, if one thing is, is for people who's wanting to move forward for H and everything is find something you're passionate about and love and dedication because it's going to take a lot of patience, you know? Yeah, there's people that can go out there and buy the elite bird, but you know, you can take and you have the dedication, you have the patience, even with our P-file genetics, we've got genetics in different colors and patterns. It takes us 20 to 30 years to get what we're looking for. So it is, there's a lot of dedication goes on with the poultry industry and a lot of patience and time and, you know, a lot of money and all that stuff. So that's the big thing is just, I would say, is find something that you love to do and you love to mess around with and so find something you like looking at, so. It's good advice across the board.